From the Lean Enterprise Institute in Boston, this is the WLEI Podcast, where we share stories of people making the world better through lean thinking and practice. For more information about LEI, including how we can help you apply lean thinking, please visit lean.org. While lean can trace its direct roots to the production system launched by Toyota more than 50 years ago, its timeless appeal translates into immediate practical countermeasures in a surprising number of situations. Not only has lean proved invaluable in tackling vital issues in industries ranging from healthcare to financial services to farming, but its core principles have emerged as a fundamental countermeasure to the core challenges of current economic challenges. What a Unicorn Knows, the new book by authors Matt May and Pablo Dominguez, proves this by presenting a comprehensive application of lean principles that couldn't be more timely. Their book draws from Matt's years of experience working at Toyota and then further researching these ideas, as well as Pablo's hands-on experience to share a framework they call SCALE, a system of ideas that can help emerging companies grapple with the excesses of recent growth by rethinking their way of doing business using lean, and in so doing, remove the many forms of waste they have created habitually and which form a drag on profits, not to mention purpose. Lean followers will find a thoughtful and useful application of lean ideas in their timeless and simultaneously timely new book. Good day and welcome to WLEI, the podcast of the Lean Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Tom Ehrenfeld. And today I am delighted to have the authors of a new book, What a Unicorn Knows, How Leading Entrepreneurs Use Lean Principles to Drive Sustainable Growth. The authors are Matt May and Pablo Dominguez from Insight Partners. Um, and Matt is probably familiar to many of your you listeners. He's written, I think, half a dozen books at least two or three of which have won the Shingo Award, In Pursuit of Elegance, The Elegant Solution, I believe, um, The Shimbuni, which is that, Matt? Shibumi, I mean, like, the Shibumi Strategy. The Shimbumi Strategy. These are really just lovely, well-made books that share, uh, if if not orthodox lean, lean-infused um, adjacent ideas and applications. And this new book, um, I think, does a top-notch job of kind of sifting through lean, of demonstrating what lean is. And Matt, you were inside Toyota for many years. And presents a set of ideas for companies in today's economy and today's way of working to scale up and grow um, in a healthy way. And the title may be about unicorns as we know them today in today's Argot, but it's really this framework for growing in a healthy, sustainable, dynamic way. So with that as the preface, I'm still going to ask you guys to um, provide some, I think you refer to it in the book, the what and the so what. Uh, just give us a quick precis of, of what the book offers to the reader. And so what, you know, what, what, what about this set of ideas? Pablo, take it away. This is right up your alley, bro. <laughs> this is Matt yeah. speaking. Yeah, so uh, let me just introduce myself real quick. So Pablo Dominguez, I am with Insight Partners. We are a, a venture capital private equity firm that invests in uh, software growth companies. And I've spent uh, the 25 years of my career literally only focused on go-to-market sales and marketing effectiveness in consulting public companies, a startup, uh, and now here at Insight Partners. So I've had the pleasure of seeing a lot of different elements. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Matt May, for about 11 years um, in a public company, a startup, and now at Insight. And so Matt and I, about six years ago, started realizing that um, a lot of the ways that we were applying uh, lean principles were specific to the go-to-market motion, right? So go-to-market being 
marketing, sales, post sales, as opposed to the more traditional, uh, you know, manufacturing or product uh, elements, and um, started to to realize the positive impact it was having on companies we were working with, and wanted to share those principles with the ecosystem, right? Just because no one has really touched lean on the go-to-market side. Um, and so the book is basically a culmination of, you know, over a decade of working together with various size companies, different industries, um, all shared with a very simple uh, moniker called scale, right? And mm-hmm. Matt, Matt will go through what those elements are because we work with companies to help them scale. Um and applying lean elements all the way from, you know, strategy to actually process. And uh, yeah, the book is very practical. Uh, We provide concrete examples. It's a book that you can read and actually put to practice, given a lot of the templates uh, that we've provided. Uh, And neither Matt or I are academics in lean, right? So we are not uh, from academia with PhDs. Uh, We are operators that have lived and breathed this and seen it happen. And so we are super excited uh, to share this with the uh, the lean community, but also with any business that's looking to scale effectively. Matt, you want to uh, give us a little more um, stuff about, say, the scale framework and the kind of key ideas here? Yeah, um, and I kind of like the way that uh, Paulo um, did the so what before the what, because oftentimes we're really good at, at pitching the what and everybody's left scratching our heads going, all right, so what? So Paulo gave you the so what? Um, and, 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 you know, to, to you know, just kind of tag it very, very briefly, it's uh, the success factor has been kind of through the roof on this. So that's kind of the, the so what. And the what is, is what Pablo referred to is this, what we call the unicorn model. It is an acronym. Got to have an acronym uh, when you're writing a book, um, Tom. I'm sure you uh, you know that, right? Got to be able to remember it. And it's five lean, as you say, lean infused principles. Um, it it is scale. It's strategic speed. It's constant experimentation. It's accelerated value. It's lean process, and it's esprit de corps. The first four are uh, you know, basically operating principles. As as you heard Pablo say, we're we're operators at heart. Um, practitioners. The fourth one is more of an organiza- organizational or leadership principle that kind of you know, brings the first four together in a way that actually can move a culture, move a company. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can dig in anywhere you want, but that is, that's the heart of the book. The book is, is written around that uh, framework. And we share, as Pablo said, um, frameworks, agendas, resources uh, that we use every day with our portfolio companies and and you know the the world should know we have over 500 portfolio companies um you know kind of in that 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 whole tech software b2b space but it is rather unique and gosh um eager to share more of, of the meat on the bone so i'm gonna turn it back to you tom to, to poke away one observation of mine in reading the book is how timely it is, that there's a both a timeless quality and a timely one. Like many of these principles are derived from Toyota and subsequent like lean iterations in its the way it's been codified and shared. Um, but it struck me as a book that is relevant today, Wednesday, March 15th at 3.18 p.m. It's or 12 for you guys, that what it offers feel like carefully designed countermeasures to some of the flaws we're seeing in the way companies operate. So we are in a moment where a lot of companies, subscription-based companies in the SaaS space that you guys um, focus on, had a decade of really rapid growth you know, following Mark Andreessen's um, Software's Eating the World article and just a huge number. And we're seeing that um, that's, that growth has been really shattered um, and, and we're in a new environment. And many of the things that you propose and suggest in the book deal with simplifying companies that may have gotten complicated and um, adrift as a result of rapid growth, who um, basically 
operated without a mindfulness. And I think that's one of the kind of underlying elements of the book is that it tells how to provide mindfulness about um, how you're growing. Um, and that is actually a, a question, which is how relevant is it today and what aspects of how companies are um, working does it uh, address? Probably want me to take that first and yeah. what do you want to do? Okay. Go for it, then I'll add some color. Okay. Um, I think it is appropriate for the times, but it's appropriate for all times. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, one of the things, and I, I know your listeners know this, um, you know, better than anyone. If you look at the, the genetics, don't make lean, assumptions, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you look at the genetics of, of lean, you know, you don't need me to tell you that, um, uh, you know, lean enterprise Institute and Jim Womack and, you know, all that comes from a, a company we know, uh, as Toyota. And if you look at the the history of Toyota, they have faced and survived and thrived disaster after disaster after disaster. Um, irrespective of a pandemic that brought all the world online, irrespective of uh, interest rates that now uh, curtail you know, capital investment to a degree, irrespective of natural disasters like tidal waves, like fires, uh, like worldwide financial crisis, they have steadily grown in a sustainable way. They have not had a, a full-time salaried layoff in decades, as I know that, that most of you know. Why is that? You know, what is it that that uh, we can learn from the the tenets and the philosophies and the principles that underlie? The stuff that we see, the practices, the you know, the kaizen events, the sprints, the five S stuff, all of that, that. Those are those are, you know, visible manifestations of something deeper, and that's what we try to get to uh, in this book is the deeper principle that then is pointed toward whatever domain, whatever uh, uh, space that you are playing in. There is a simpler, a more waste free way to approach your business. And that's really kind of, I think what you're getting at in terms of the timelessness, but also timely. So something that's timeless is timely by definition, right? So it doesn't matter what time you're looking at it. it, it it's timely. Um, right now, you know, everyone is facing resource constraints. Right. Perfect. Because that is just, that is just right in the, you know, the strike zone of anything labeled lane. Yeah. And I think that uh, what I'm also hearing between the lines is that um, it's a powerful uh, proof that over the long run, there's a correlation between processes and products or outcomes that Toyota has performed consistently in a superior way because it really has this mindfulness about how it's producing what it's producing and has a, a whole range of kind of tangible habits or tools that bring that mindfulness um, into operation. Yeah, let me add something. Um, and Matt and I were lucky enough to speak with uh, Reshma Sojani, who wrote the afterword for the book. She's the no, former CEO no. of Girls Who Code and um, uh, Marshall Mom for Plans. I think now it's called CEO for Moms. And one thing she says, and I'll, I'll bastardize the quote a little bit, was, you know, always operate in a time of crisis, right? And when Matt and I look at the most successful companies, both public companies that we work, other companies that are private, the ones that have not only achieved unicorn status, right, but have crossed the threshold of 100 million in ARR or even become billion dollar plus companies, they follow these principles, not only in a time of actual crisis like we're in today, but even in times of boom, Right. And that's what makes the best companies and the best leaders the best is that they're always thinking about how to be effective, right? Not waiting for something to break. And chapter one, which talks about strategy, right? To apply it to, to lean principles. I, I love the quote from Michael Porter around, you know, the essence of strategy is um, choosing what not to do, right? And well, Peter Drucker is another source of that. Yeah. Sorry, Drucker. Um, and so the, in today's world, 
like that, that couldn't be more true, right? The advising that Matt and I are giving companies right now is you have to be very thoughtful about your strategy as a company, right? Companies might have, uh, to your point, the last 10 years of growth that we've seen, let me go into different markets. Let me roll out every product possible. Let me hire people here, here. And the companies that I think right now are surviving, that we see surviving, have made very thoughtful decisions on what to do and what not to do versus trying to spread themselves too thin. Mm. You also guys have a quote I really like from, I think, Billie Jean King. Uh, pressure is a privilege. So she, it's it's shared in the spirit of saying that, you know, having a, a it's a good pressure to improve. Yeah, and Toyota was was a master of it, and and I'll tell you the fl- the flip side of the coin is it irked me to no end that they they um, weren't able to to celebrate. And um, uh, my colleague here, Pablo, I think his superpower is is that of being able to construct an amazing team and knows how to celebrate uh, the you know the meaningful wins. And it always just irked me. I, I remember when when Toyota you know overtook uh, GM, for example, um, you know standing around the, the atrium in Torrance, California, where Jim Press, who was the uh, you know the U.S. leader, um, said, "Well, we're the biggest, but you know what." Our customer satisfaction is barely above average, not good enough. And you just kind of see people's, you know, heads fall. So there comes a time and a place for the, for pressure. Um, yeah. And which kind of gets to the whole notion of balance, um, which is the another undercurrent of this entire book is there's no one thing um, that you can pull out of this book that is in and of itself going to give you, you know, any significant lift. It's, it's how you balance and blend these principles um, in your kitchen. Which prompts me to kind of leap forward. I thought the um, you have this scale acronym for four ideas followed by the fifth. I'm being a little rough here, but the notion is that the fifth one, which is esprit de corps, is the thing that holds them all together. It's the principle that, um, the necessary principle for the four prior ones to realize their synergistic power. Um, and can you can you just explain what you mean there and how it ties together uh, the previous four? Yeah, so um, I come from, uh, my grandfather fought in World War II. Okay. And um, he landed in Normandy and had the pleasure or not pleasure of spending the next three to four months uh, doing her- Herculean and heroic things and um, had two sons that were also in the military, uh, my uncles who did uh, two tours in Nam. All three of them lived and came back, uh, surprisingly, not no Purple Heart, no, uh, no, no, nothing hurt. And they would always talk about the military sort of motto of mission first, people always. And that um, always resonated with me. And I had the pleasure of having a military sergeant on my team three companies ago um, that saw battle and also lived by that mantra. Um, And Matt and I are very close to that individual. And that's sort of what Esprit de Corps is all about, right? It's It's the glue that connects the other elements um, because leadership in a company, you might have the right strategy. Sure, you might do constant experimentation. You're all about driving value for your customers. You've opt- you've optimized for lean process, right? The S, the C, A, and L in our acronym. But without leadership, um, holding that together, hiring the right people, embodying the best culture, uh, motivating people, um, it may all fall apart, right? And Matt was right that uh, there isn't one or there isn't one element that's more important than the others, but that is the element that, in my mind, keeps everything together and is sometimes, you know, it's the softer side of Sears, if you will. Uh, sometimes the leadership and and all that, but um, we love the mission first people always because that is a true differentiator for a lot of our best portfolio companies and public companies outside of Insight. Hand in hand with that is that you. Um, couple this, it's an abstract title perhaps or idea, but you guys really substantiate how to do this stuff by, you know, in the lean practice or lean principles chapter, it's 
packs an amazing amount of <laughs> suggested habits and tools to use. You guys talk about um, how to use an A3 to um, get agreement and um, to kind of structure learning and curiosity. You have your own title for value stream maps. What is it? Cust I forget. Customer value mapping. Customer value mapping. Um, you talk about Hosh and Conry. You uh, even have this reference to auto no motion. This from Taichi Ono. So it's it's really informed by and constructed of how lean practices work comprehensively and systematically. Um, and <clears throat> I wonder, like, how difficult or easy is it for companies to basically adopt or even understand both the kind of grounded practices that are required for this system um, and, you know, like know how to do them and know how to put them into practice so they connect so that the Christmas tree lights light up. Well, I'll start with that. And then I want to, I would love for Pablo to, um, you know, dovetail on that because he has, he's the audience here, right? So um, the individual that he referred to earlier uh, from the military was the guy that first contacted me. Um, and uh, I, I spent a day and a half with uh, Pablo's team. Didn't know he was the leader at the time, but um, that, that was the springboard for, you know, a decade plus long relationship in which he, you know, adopted um, at least the, the the brand of lean that I was sharing and and know this, um, I spent better part of a decade inside an organization that struggled mightily to take the production version of all this stuff into the knowledge work. So I worked for Toyota, you know, sales USA, the, kind of the, the mothership of distribution for all the retail dealerships uh, in the United States. So essentially a go-to-market operation. And I'll tell you, they tried, before I started working there, um, and you know, they, they tried. They tried TPS, Toyota Production System for the office. They tried any number of things and had you know several fits and starts. And when they formed the University of Toyota, I don't know how it wasn't, a, it wasn't anything I asked for, but I just got attached to this project that was meant to take the principles um, that, that work so well in a closed manufacturing environment or production environment, you know, warehouses even, and into the knowledge world where these are salespeople, this is human, you know, resources, this is marketing, completely different, you know, things weren't as repetitive. And we had to figure out a way to, uh, port that over in a way that was digestible. So, you know, if if you were to ask um, anyone that reading this book is what's missing here is you will not find a lot of Japanese. Yeah, you said Hoshin Kanri. I may have mentioned it, but I don't beat anyone over the head. We don't beat anyone over the head with all of these various and assorted uh, Japanese concepts that are you, you know just you difficult to grasp. So go ahead. No, you, no, please go on. I'm just, you cite uh, Nimawashi, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll throw a few out there. But um, as Pablo will tell you, nowhere in that first session where I took them through the production, Toyota production system, and we built cars using the official uh, University of Toyota simulation, which we use to this day, um, that I've obviously tweaked for the audience. But um, nowhere do I, you know, pound them over the head with all of these various and assorted methods. They, we do this in a way that is visceral. People get it by experiencing it in a very compressed period of time. And we begin working with them in kind of the natural way, but just applying just enough, just enough framework and constraint to, uh, to focus their human creative energy in a way that, that is you know, targeted to some big sales goal. You know, if you want to take a half Half out of your, your sales cycle, cut in half, we'll do that, right? We, we'll gather the right gladiators. We'll have a little bit of framework, give them a little bit of, of here's the, the methodology, but we'll go from there. So that's kind of the, the, the magic elixir, I think, in getting people to adopt it is to make it not so far and make it seem, okay, I've, I've heard about this and this kind of works with the way that I work. Right, right. Yeah, Pablo, you can, you can, you know, let me know if I'm, you know, off the mark on that, but uh, no, I think that's right. I mean, con considering I've, you know, 
done so many of these sessions with our companies and, and, you know, prior to insight, I think um, a lot of our engagements, Tom, um, surprisingly people say, wow, after I do this initial session with Matt and Pablo and learn about how to optimize process. And yeah, Matt is, I'm not kidding, building cars with executives at top software companies. A lot of them built, start out a, they take a team and build out a PMO, right? A project management organization within the company to say, all right, we're going to leverage what we learned and go apply this somewhere else. Almost like Matt's like train the trainer, right? And that's when you know the company is thinking in a lean way versus, all right, one and done, we fix this one thing. They're like, they see value and they want to replicate it somewhere else and take ownership for it, right? Um, without applying all the fancy Japanese jargon and stuff, they get the basics. Um, and we've seen a lot of success with a lot of our companies that way. Very short digression. It's like I've encountered this so-called problem um, repeatedly in many years helping LAI um, produce content where people say, you know, too many Japanese terms. And I, I honestly feel like it's the wrong question. It's not about the amount. It's simply finding the best way to present each idea in the most elegant and evocative way. And there are times where a Japanese word is better and um, belongs there and does force non-Japanese speaking person to understand the meaning of it, be it something like Gemba or Nemawashi. By the but way, I fully agree. Sorry to interrupt because on that point, and we'll apply this to, I think this applies to many companies, the term Kanban, right? Yeah. People, when we teach people about that, they, they go, wait, is that why it's called a Kanban board in the engineering software when tickets come in and they get assigned to engineers and you go, yes because you're you're putting and they go oh so it does it actually does light bulb goes on in terms of connecting the dots with terms that might be used today that people are completely unaware of right so i totally agree and really the purpose is to help people understand it both abstractly and in practice so kanban cards just play this vital role in facilitating flow in just in time in a factory yeah. and they are habits and tools that emerged out of toyota practice out of what you guys again talk about is constant experimentation um i i will put in a plug here there's a great book called the birth of lean that shares how the toyota production system was produced over decades at toyota like people look at it now and they think that it's this some ideated complete system that some <laughs> folks went off into a boardroom and designed and yeah. it's not it was something that was developed by a company with limited resources at the time and huge pressure and it it experimented constantly and had this unique mindset where it was willing and able to implement what it had learned and and um, move on from that. Um, so I don't know, one thing that calls to mind is, again, I, I think the mastery with which you guys use even terms like uh, standardized work, or you call it SOP, standard operating procedure, and you explain how vital it is for companies to capture it, and then use that as a basis for improvement. Um, am I being uh, accurate in, in sharing how you guys share it and, and maybe talk about how that was one example of a tangible practice that fits into your argument and supports what you're trying to help folks do. Sure. I mean, well, look, I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I like to, you know, when, let me share a, a little bit of um, behind the curtains. I'm not going to share anything that's not in the book, but it's, let me bring to life the, the lean process uh, chapter, which really revolves around this day and a half engagement that we have with our portfolio companies, where the first uh, half day is the experiential, uh, you know, Toyota production simulation, where we build cars kind of the natural fraught with waste Detroit way. And then I flip the little switch and we do things the, 
the Toyota way and we have four to five, you know, X improvement, quality, cost, speed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we look at the operation through a lens of subtraction, but we always talk about the, the notion of standard operating procedures being the basis for constant experimentation, and continuous improvement. And I'll, I'll it kind of never fails. I'll, I'll ask the question, um, golfers in the room, raise your hand. And there's always, you know, three or four people. Um, do you go to the driving range? Yeah. Would you ever go on a super cloudy, foggy day? No. Why? Well, because I could tweak something on the driving range, right? And I don't know the feedback. I don't know what's going to happen where that ball lands because I can't see it because it's a foggy day. You could completely destroy your swing. So that's the notion of, of having a standard operating procedure. And it never fails. When we do first projects with our portfolio companies, it never fails that the root cause of whatever process we're trying to optimize is the fact that there is no standard in place. The company has grown leaps and bounds, um, added people, scaled up, become more complex, so many moving parts, everyone doing something a little bit differently, and no one is has bothered to study their best, understand what's the best known method this today, document it, and then move from there. And then when that light bulb goes off, the rest is just kind of clear, you know, clear sailing. So that's how we make the point, kind of just, you know, bring it home to stuff people do all the time, every day. And that's just how constant experiment, continuous improvement has to work. Otherwise, you're just, hey, what can we improve? What can we experiment with? What can we improve? Which gets you nowhere, right? That's just That'll just get you back to the, the problem that you had in the first place. And I can tell you that a lot of our CEOs are a little bit worried about you know being in constant beta mode. Um, so we got to kind of balance, you know, constant experimentation with, Hey, we're in business here. This is business experimentation. This is an experimentation for experimentation's sake. One of the great things of, about, um, asking people to, you know, use a standard operating procedure as a basis for improvement is that it kind of answers this question of what must be true, which you guys, I think, raise in a different context in the book, but it forces companies to understand what they are doing. It brings this kind of very tangible awareness of how are we producing what we produce that delivers value or how are we delivering value. And um, I think that, you know, again, it's it's almost elegant because it's- it Almost. It's elegant. <laughs> 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 um Paul, what were you saying there no i was i was gonna try and make it let me give you a real example to everybody that actually doesn't even tie to go to market and goes back to that ties back to esprit de corps right mission first people always um recruiting right talent people are the, uh, uh, any company's most precious resources and very few companies have standard operating procedures for how to hire Right. It's just like, yeah, let's let's have recruiters find people, put them through a process. But, you know, if you think about how much more effective you can be to say there is a process for starting at the top of the funnel and, you know, reaching out to 100 people. We know that the hiring manager should, should be the first person to do a call for 30 minutes to vet the person. Then we have these three people. Then there's going to be a case study. Then the team meets to review. Right. We do weighted average scoring. Uh, then we make an offer. Why? Because we know onboarding takes seven to nine months and people's productivity is important. So when you can build a, uh, an SOP, even around something like that, right, the amount of efficiency and effectiveness that you can get as an organization uh, is amazing. And Matt, Matt and I actually did a lean engagement with an HR team at one of the companies I was at before. It wasn't even sales or marketing or post sales because uh, there is waste everywhere, <laughs> yeah. as, as we all know. Yeah. And the two things I'm going <clears> to <throat> read uh, just a chunk from your book. It's the recap of the lean process chapter. And I just want to urge our listeners to buy the book and read it all, especially I think it's chapter four, because it, it just it encompasses quite a lot of established lean practice and presents it in a tangible way a contextual way that explains why you're doing it. Um, and then I, I'm i going to read this and then I'm going to ask you guys to kind of circle back and 
place this book in the right now. Like, let me get to that, if, if I may. Um, you guys talk about the lean process recap. And you say waste is defined simply as work that no one wants, needs, cares about, or even asked for. It is the fourth restraining force and arch enemy of all efforts to scale for growth. It impedes the free flow of value to customers and slows the capture of value from customers. Lean process optimization is the antidote because it specifically targets waste with the goal of eliminating everything that lengthens the time from order to cash. A lean process is like a Formula One pit stop, a two second activity performed by highly trained individuals, each with a single precise role in a standardized way and constantly improved to save tenths of a second. Optimizing processes in fast paced, high growth companies is best achieved through a Kaizen sprint, a modern approach to continuous improvement based on standardized work. A simple framework for process optimization is the Lean Kaizen Canvas, which embeds the scientific problem process and offers what can be a self-guided approach. And I shared that because I just strongly believe it hits on all the right elements of what Lean um, offers, what companies who practice it, what qualities they develop. And uh, above all, and this is where I'm going to ask you how it relates to companies' need today. So why do companies need to eliminate waste? Why do they need to remove everything that gets them, gets their products and services to market quicker? Yeah, so we're in a very tumultuous economic time, right? Matt and I are not economists. Tom, neither are you nor is anybody on this call. And even if we were economists, we're never right anyway, right? But there are headwinds facing all of us globally. Um, and we've seen the news about uh, reductions in force across all companies. Companies are having to make very tough decisions on, again, strategic choices, right? Whether they roll out new products, et cetera. Um, and what we're seeing is sales processor sales processes are elongating because chief financial officers are now evaluating every purchasing decision, right? Your product is now not only being decided upon, you know, maybe I was the buyer. Now the CFO is, you know, evaluating your solution against the other hundred solutions that the company is looking at, right? And so you've got to be above that line. And um, even more than ever, there is a need to be very effective and efficient and remove waste in that process because customers have choices. And they're under a lot of pressure to save money, uh, to, to onboard products more effectively and quickly. And if you can't get your product to market in the most efficient way and get your customer using it, adopting it, wanting to buy more, and also renewing it whenever a contract comes up for renewal, you're going to lose to the competition, right? So the application of lean in the sales motion from quote to cash uh, is even more critical today uh, to remain competitive. Um, but again, like we said before, the companies that will continue to be the best are always thinking that way, not just now. That's a great place to stop, I think. Um, so again, uh, it's Matt May and Pablo Dominguez talking about what a unicorn knows, uh, how leading entrepreneurs use lean principles to drive sustainable growth. Um, I want to thank you both for joining us as guests. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thanks so much to Matt and to Pablo for discussing their new book, What a Unicorn Knows. And thanks also to Matt Savis of LAI for producing this podcast. And above all, thank you, our faithful listener, for tuning in to this episode of WLAI.